Let's just go back. I want, to, I want to share a little bit of our story with you and hope that it encourages you today. All right, let's go back about 13 years ago. Uh, Lisa and I had been active. You know, we've been believers for about 15 years at this point. We've been active in every church that we've been a part of, okay? Um, we volunteered pretty much every Sunday. Um, we were generous with our giving. We were just very active, but the reality is, at that point in our walk with Jesus, we were, we were very frustrated. No matter what we did, we always seemed to be struggling in our lives. And if you were to ask me at that point in my life, I would have been hard-pressed to, to explain how our lives were different from my unbelieving friends around me. I mean, I could quote you scriptures. Uh, I, I knew that we were forgiven. I knew that we were going to heaven when we died, which was awesome. And I had been set free from alcohol, gloriously, supernaturally, by God. So there was that. And... The other thing was we tended to get up earlier on Sunday mornings than my unbelieving friends. But beyond that, there was very little difference in our lives. We had the same financial struggles, we had the same health struggles, and we especially had the same relational struggles. You know, and, and where relationships are concerned, you may not know that Lisa and I are both have very strong personalities, and we got married a little older in life, and we had a lot of what I call intense fellowships <laughs> because that sounds better than saying we argued even though that's what we really did and, and really we were on an emotional roller coaster you know some days were great and everything was awesome but then things you know the world life happens and it wasn't so good and, and it was just like up and down up and down and i read in the bible where jesus said that his yoke was easy and his burden was light but at that point in our walk it was like the exact opposite of what we were experiencing. You know, we read through the book of Acts, we looked at our lives, and there was this massive disconnect. What we saw on the page of the scripture was vastly different from what we were experiencing. You know, we felt like we were saved and stuck. And, and we got into the kingdom of God, which is awesome, yay, praise God. And we knew we were going to heaven when we died, but we didn't really experience much of the kingdom or heaven in our daily lives. And that, what, what the Bible actually addresses what we were experiencing. You see, in reality, I had received the grace of God in vain. Did you know that you can do that? That's what the Bible says I was doing. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. He says, We then, as workers, together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Jesus. That's a sentence from the Bible that's worth thinking about. You see, there was something about the church in Corinth that made Paul plead with them not to receive the grace of God in vain. Paul was urging the church in Corinth to act in accordance with their beliefs. They were like I was. I had a bit of understanding of what the Bible said, but I really didn't act on the belief that I had. I, I had belief, but I didn't have faith. You know, and according to Paul, I had received the grace of God in vain. And that's why I was saved and stuck. You see, until belief becomes faith, it's passive. And at that stage, what we believe is little more than hope. As Pastor Donnie said, we want to give hope to the world. Hope is good, but until hope becomes faith, mm -hmm. it won't have a very big impact on the world around us. Fortunately, God's grace empowers us to step into action. And when we act on what we believe, that is faith. Yes, and when we step into faith, that's the moment that God's grace becomes effective in our lives. And the reality is that passivity is receiving God's grace in vain. We see this more clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. I encourage you to look at this verse. We're going to camp out here a little bit. 1 Corinthians 15, 10 says... But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So let's, let's dig into this verse a little bit. Paul starts out by saying, by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
You see, Paul was who he was and what he was by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. You and I are too. You see, the, the country we were born into, the family, our, our, our height, eye color, uh, you know, the way our minds work, the time, this time that we're born into, and, and so much more are all things that we have no direct control over. You know, that's the fact that I'm naturally an introvert, and Lisa is like an off-the-charts extrovert. These aren't things that we had to work at. It's how God wired us. Uh, but God knew exactly what he was doing in each of our lives when he created us, just like he knew what he was doing when he created you and made you what you are. Mm -hmm. Then Paul goes on to say in this verse, and his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than them all. Paul ties the grace of God with his own labor. Yeah. All right? In Paul's case, he said he did more work than all the rest. And who is he referring to in this? Who is he referring to? You see, he's talking about the other apostles. He's talking about Peter, James, John, all those people who walked with Jesus. Paul's saying he did more labor than all the rest by the grace of God. <coughs> you see, God's grace empowers us to take action. That grace of God that you've experienced should ignite your faith and launch you into doing something. Mm -hmm. You see, Lisa and I made a decision one day that we were going to do what it took to renew our minds and get off our emotional roller coaster. Man. You know, for us, that meant moving across country from Savannah, Georgia to Colorado. It's about 1,700 miles away to go to Bible college so that we could invest some time in renewing our minds. Our hope was that by studying the Word of God and, and exposing the truth of God's Word to our mind, it might change us. That was our hope. <laughs> Boy, you did it. <laughs> you see, remember this, okay? Keep in mind, it's okay if that's something that your faith launches you into is small at first. You see, for Lisa and I, the very first faith step that we took when we decided we wanted to try to renew our minds, we filled out an application to Bible college. And then we put our house up for sale, and then we downsized our lives from a house to a smaller apartment, and we moved across country to attend Bible college. While we were going to school, we worked, and we, we took some money out of savings to cover some costs along the way. All of these things, in our case, were steps of faith. Each one was an action that we took in response to God's grace. And that action made God's grace effective in our lives. Mm -hmm. And in the process of all of that, God called us to move to Scotland, as Donnie mentioned. We came to Scotland and we opened up the Bible college down there in Dumfries. And it would take three and a half years from the time that we said yes to, to God's call until we were able to move to Scotland to, to open up the school here. And even then, there were still steps that we had to take along the way that, so that we could continue towards this assignment that God had given to us. You know, for example, we needed to raise financial support back in the States. So to accomplish that, we created a charity. We did all the legal stuff with the U.S. government to get it registered. Um, we, we put together a comprehensive plan about how we were going to launch the Bible College. We submitted that to the Karis Bible College organization for approval. Um, and then there were all the meetings, and you know, we made multiple trips over here to scout the land to see if you know God would confirm this is what He had for us. Um, and then there were more meetings, and we had to sort out visas so that we could work. We had to do planning. We had to downsize our lives almost completely. There's just some suitcases to travel over the ocean. You see, there were all kinds of things not only that we had to do, but that we had to wait on God to do that were completely beyond our control. God had to put some pieces in place that we couldn't control directly. And then that brings me to the last thing that Paul said in that verse. He said, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. You see, God's grace is what's at work within us. He's the one that gave Lisa and I the skills and abilities that we have to, to accomplish the things that we've done. He gives us favor with people along the way so that, that our tasks become easier and we start to walk in that easy yoke and that light burden. Amen. God's even the one that calls and anoints each of us for a particular assignment. See, don't misunderstand me. God gets all of the credit for what we've accomplished. Yeah. At the same time, until God's grace is mixed with our faith and we take action, we've still only received God's grace in vain. We had to believe the truth that God empowered us to do the things that we were called to do so that we could step out and start doing them. Mm -hmm. 
How do we know this is true? Well, look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Philippians chapter 4, 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, we do the all things, but we can only do them through Christ who empowers and strengthens us. You see, Lisa and I based our belief in the truth of God's word. Then we got into faith and we took action. We activated the grace that God had already given us as a result, like Paul. Now we can say we have not received God's grace in vain. You see, the truth is, God's grace has already reached down to each and every one of you, and it's time for your faith to rise up and take action. Don't hold back. Don't wait for God to show up and do something miraculous. God already is inside of you. Wherever you go, God is there by definition. Lean into his strength and his power and step into the faith that God's grace already supplies. You see, passivity is crippling much of the body of Christ today. The, this passive and fatalistic mindset, it's, it's, it's like we're slaves. And, and it's been adopted by many believers and it causes them to withdraw from the, into their church community to, to refrain from engaging the culture. And this passivity and this withdrawal from the culture is, is a huge contributing factor to the mess our world is in right now. You see, corruption of the worst kind seems to have permeated every aspect of our society. And the only way things are going to turn around is if godly men and women like yourselves, like Lisa and I, step into these situations and bring God's presence into them yes, and bring his wisdom, Amen. his peace, and his godly solutions into all of these worldly right. problems. Amen. 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 Yeah. But it shouldn't be a surprise to us that uh, so many believers have a passive mindset. You see, Adam did the same thing in the garden. If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, um, in the temptation when Satan tempted him, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, it says that the woman saw that the tree was good and for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of, his fruit, some of its fruit and ate it, and she also gave it to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. You see, when the serpent tempted Eve, Adam was standing right there the whole yeah. time. Yeah. And Adam passively said absolutely nothing. He is the one that God had been given authority yeah. oh, over yeah. the entire yeah. garden. He was told to keep it, meaning he was supposed to guard it and protect yeah. Yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> you have an interloper that came in, tempted his wife, and rather than speaking up and saying, get out, because he had that authority to do yeah. that, he passively stood there and went down with the ship. Mm -hmm. And we've been having the same problem ever since. Okay? Jesus repeatedly praised people for their boldness. He tended to praise the faith of those who boldly came to him. Um, and this often, despite the fact that his disciples were being bothered by those who wanted to get to Jesus. And to be fair, some of them were kind of obnoxious about how they approached Jesus. You know, for example, once there was a Canaanite woman who came to Jesus to get healing for her daughter. Jesus initially refused her. Yeah, yeah. And he said, look, I, I've come to the, the, the Israelites. I've, I've come to the, the, the tribe of Israel and, and to God's people, and you're outside of the covenant, and you're not, you know, I'm not here. And she refused to take no for an answer. She kept coming to him. And as a matter of fact, Jesus ramped it up a notch and yeah. insulted her. Yeah. He called her a dog. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, hey, even the dogs get scratched from the master's table. Yeah, she yeah. was not taking no for an answer. And look at what that, it says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said, Oh, woman, great is your faith. Amen. Yeah. She wasn't willing to let offense get in the way of her miracle. Um, she took the kingdom of God by force. Another time, a, a beggar, a, a blind man. The, the Bible calls him blind Bartimaeus. I want to call him blind Bartimaeus, but Lisa says that's disrespectful. So we'll call him blind Bartimaeus, just like the Bible does. But he started shouting after Jesus, hoping that he would get Jesus' attention. And the crowd was trying to shush him. Shush, 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 shush quiet, quiet, he's coming by, shh. And he just was like, you know, son of David, have mercy on me. And as before, Jesus recognized Bartimaeus' faith. Uh, Mark 10, 52 says, go your way, your faith has made you well. He acknowledged that Barnabas was expressing faith. You see, these are just two of the great many examples throughout Scripture where Jesus praised people's boldness in the gospel accounts. 
And he often tied that boldness to expressions of faith as he performed miracles on their behalf. Okay? In addition to praising boldness, Jesus also had some very harsh things to say about passivity. This is kind of sobering. If you remember the parable of the talents, this is one example. In that parable, we see two servants who each got money before the master went away, and they took that money, they invested it in the, the business world, they put it in the economy, and they, they got a return on their investment. And the maths, master gave them praise for, for doing that. However, there was a third servant. I want to focus in on this third servant because he had a passive mindset. And he buried his master's treasure in the ground until the master returned. Jesus. This third passive servant, guess what Jesus called him? Yeah. Wicked yeah. and lazy. All right, you can see that in Matthew uh, chapter 25, 26, if you want to look it up. But in the verse immediately before that, we see why he was passive. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 25, the servant says, And I was afraid. Yeah. The, the servant was afraid. Just like with that servant in this parable, fear is often the underlying mm -hmm. path. That, 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 that's what's really underlying this passive mindset that believers have today. They're afraid. Keep in mind, fearfulness that is a mindset of a slave, not a son That's of God. Right. We are all sons and daughters of the Most High God. Amen. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to have those slave mindsets because we have an inheritance now in the kingdom of God. And just, in that, just as in that parable, the hidden problem behind many believers' passivity today is fearfulness. And, and the real issue is they don't know the Father's true character. Right. This, the, the, this slave, this servant, didn't know his master's character and nature. And he accused him wrongly. Yeah. And even then, he didn't follow through with what he was saying because the, the, in the parable, the, the master used his own words against him to condemn him. You see, fear leads to passivity and cowardice. Cowardice is explicitly condemned in the New Testament. So much so that if you go all the way to the end in Revelation, yeah. the cowardly are going to be the first in line to spend eternity in hell in the lake of fire in the book of Revelation. Revelation 21.8 starts off by saying, but the cowardly. And yeah. it goes through and lists a whole bunch of unbelieving, abominable murders, blah, 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 blah. They shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns, or with, with, with a lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You see, obviously, Jesus sees passivity as a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. That's the bad news. I got good news. Who wants the good news? Oh, yeah. All right. Intimacy with God is the solution to this problem because understanding God's character and nature can only uh, flow out of an intimate relationship with Him. We can only understand who God really is when we get close to Him. That's right. All right? It's, it's in that relationship where we get a true revelation of His mm -hmm. love for us. Yes, and right. as we do, we begin to experience His goodness and see all His good plans that He has for us. Plus, that's where we can begin to walk in the outrageously abundant life that Jesus said He came to make available to Amen. us. Yes. And they're all available to us, like we said this morning, through His promises. You see, only then do we begin to leave that fearful passivity behind. I know. I've experienced this transition. And, and that's when we begin to, to walk in a powerful, faith-filled, boldly proactive adventure with God. Yes. So we have that. And, and look at it. John says it this way. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, he says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear, Amen. because fear involves torment. But he who fears is not the man perfect in love. And this is what Paul was getting at in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, when he says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or imagine, according to the power that works within us. Yeah. You see, God's power is his grace, and that power works within us through the release of our faith. It works through us, but only with our cooperation. When God's when the, when the power of God's grace combines with our faith and begins working in our lives, God is able to accomplish 
immeasurably more than all that we can ask or imagine. I mean, think about that. I, I got a pretty vivid imagination. I can imagine pretty big. That's peanuts, chump change, compared to what God can do once I come into full agreement with him and his word. Um, God's already done his part. The grace is there. It's available to anyone willing to receive it. The way I was explaining this to somebody um, in one of the places we've been in the last couple of weeks, I said, it's like, it's like God has prepared a Christmas tree and there's a whole bunch of packages underneath it that are wrapped with your name on it. If you don't take yeah. possession yeah. of those packages, yeah. if you don't unwrap them yeah. and make them your own, yes. they'll do you no good. They just sit under the tree. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is with the God's promises in the Bible. They're all there. They're all wrapped up. They've all got each one of your names on them. Amen. All 7,000 promises belong to each and every one of us. Yeah. But if we don't take possession of them, we gain no benefit from Jesus. them. And it's like they're just sitting there under the tree waiting for, waiting for us to open them up. God's already done his part. See, far from being passive, the Christian faith is designed to be proactive and productive. But unfortunately, a large portion of the body of Christ is trapped in passivity. Their passive slave mindsets are what's causing them to wait for God to do something on their behalf. And, and they'll look to passages like Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, to kind of back up their passivity. If you're familiar with that, it's, it's a famous passage. Um, Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. You see, many misunderstand that, like I did years ago, to mean that if we sit back and passively wait for God to do stuff, amazing things are going to happen. Um, but on the face of it, it kind of seems like that's what it means. But let's examine that verse more deeply. You see, the Hebrew word translated wait in that verse, to wait on the Lord, is kava. And that Hebrew word literally means to bind together, perhaps by twisting, to collect. The figurative meaning of that word is to wait, to look for, hope, or expect. It means to look eagerly for, yes. to lie in wait for. Yeah. You see, in truth, there's an active expectancy contained in that word. It's not mm -hmm. passive at all. And when we consider what happens as a result, it, it seems obvious it has to be active somehow. I mean, think about it. How could you know if your strength has been renewed if you do nothing that requires strength? Yeah. I mean, how, how can you mount up with anything, much less eagle's wings, if you're just sitting back? Mm -hmm. how, how would you know if you get weary or faint, if you're passively planted waiting for God to move you? Mm -hmm. Yes, we wait on God, but we wait expectantly making ourselves ready to respond the moment God does move on our, our behalf. I mean, that's what Lisa and I did when we were preparing to move here to Scotland. We were preparing and we were getting ourselves ready so that the moment that, that things lined up, and for us the big obstacle obviously was a work visa. Once that obstacle was cleared, we were ready to go. We didn't have to go, okay, now we'll start planning. No, mm -hmm. we've been working on it all along to get ready to be in that position. You see, this is what Jesus was talking about when he was talking about um, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Matthew eleven twelve. 12. You see, this verse perplexed me. It, it just, I was like, I don't get it. Because on the face of it, it sounds like heaven's going to be defeated by hostile invading forces. Uh, yeah. It's what it sounds like, right? But that's not what Jesus was communicating at all. You see, this verse is in the middle of Jesus talking about his cousin, John the Baptist. And what Jesus was saying is that the kingdom of God is not going to just drop in your lap. Mm -hmm. Jesus means that it will take a passion and a willingness to mm -hmm. press into God's yes. kingdom yes. in order to see its benefits in your, in your life. You, you may have to overcome some obstacles, some barriers, some things that are hindering you from receiving that miracle. Just like those examples like blind Bartimaeus and, and the Canaanite woman did. Um, but Jesus was saying that once John the Baptist came on the scene preaching the power of the Holy Spirit, some people were willing to overcome big obstacles to go way out in the desert to hear him. And since that time, passionate people have been pressing in to the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. See, Jesus was comparing their determination with a violent force that's willing to do what it takes to win the battle, to, to take the kingdom of God by force. 
You see, this idea of taking the kingdom of God by force is a radically different mindset than many believers have today. But we see that passionate determination to receive a miracle from Jesus, to receive God's best from the kingdom throughout the gospel accounts. You know, we already talked about uh, the Canaanite woman. We already talked about blind Bartimaeus. Each one of them took the kingdom of God by force. Here's another example. If you remember, there were four guys that had a friend who was paralyzed. And they wanted to get to Jesus, but there was this huge crowd. And Jesus was in the house, but they couldn't get past the crowd. So they got an idea. They went up on the roof, cut a hole through the roof, and lowered their friend down. And they took the kingdom of God by force. And their, their friend was healed because of that. Um, and I think it's interesting that Jesus commended their faith, yeah. not, the, not the man who was healed's faith. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Okay? Um, another time, Jesus was walking through Jericho with his disciples, and there was a guy named Zacchaeus. We all know the story, right? Yeah. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He was short. Big crowd. Short guy. Can't see. He's like, I want to see Jesus. So he climbs up a tree. He didn't let the fact that there was a big crowd and couldn't see past it keep him from seeing Jesus. And as a result, Jesus went to have dinner with him at his house, and, and he received salvation. He, he took the kingdom of God by force. Um, another example, there was a man who had a son, and the son suffered from seizures. And, and he took the son to Jesus' disciples because they were, they were the ones praying for people, and they didn't get any results. And he could have said, oh, well, I guess, you know, you know, sometimes God heals, sometimes he doesn't. I guess it's not for me. And he could have walked off, mm -hmm. but he didn't. He pressed in. He, he, he was like, he, he actually created a scene, and the disciples were trying to calm him down, and Jesus is like, hey, what's going on over there? And, and the guy said, look, I, I brought my son that couldn't heal him. Can you please heal him? And he did. The man, that man took the kingdom of God by force. He didn't take no for an answer. He got his miracle for his son. Um, then there was the, the woman with the issue of blood. We all know that story. Yeah. She was unclean. She had no business being mm -hmm. in a big crowd. She had spent all of her money trying to get well and was unable to. But she broke the, the law, literally, to go into that crowd as an unclean woman. She's like, I'll just touch the hem of his garment. He'll never know. I'll get my healing and, and that'll be good. Except Jesus felt the power go out from her. And... Instead of punishing her for breaking the law, he commended her for her great faith because she took the kingdom of God by force. So that is, is what we're talking about. And, and there's, there's one more piece to this puzzle that I want to I put in before we, we close off here. You see, there's another verse that, that confused me for a long time. Jesus said that many are called, but few are chosen. That's Matthew 22, verse 14. Uh, what's the difference between being called and chosen? How come then you're called if you're chosen? What, what does it all mean? Well, as we know, the gospel invitation is sent to everyone, right? Yeah. Everyone is available. Everyone is called. Literally, everyone in the world has been extended the invitation for salvation. Um, it's not the Father's will that a single person be excluded from heaven and spend outer dark, you know, spend eternity in the outer darkness of hell. That's not God's will. Many are called. God's grace has literally been extended to every That's single right. human being. Yeah. However, not everyone wants God. Yeah. Plus, many who claim to want Him don't want Him on His terms. Mm -hmm. They want to, you know, try to dictate their own terms. And these people receive God's grace in vain. And then there are those who are saved who enter God's kingdom because of their willingness to accept his sovereign, gracious provision. They are chosen. You see, their faith meets God's grace and is effective, and God's grace becomes effective in their life as it connects with their faith. Those who are lost are excluded from the kingdom because of their willingness, their, their willing rejection of sovereign grace. They choose to reject God's grace. Therefore, many are called you are chosen. We become chosen when we respond to God's call positively. You see, Lisa and I were chosen for ministry down there in, in the south of Scotland because we said yes. I, I know that God called others before us, but they were not chosen 
because they didn't respond in faith. In fact, Lisa asked God about that very thing. You can talk to her later afterwards. But what she said was, surely we're not your plan A here. Because we knew that other people had probably been called. And here's what God said. When you said yes, you became my plan A. And that's the same thing that God will say to you. And I can show you from Scripture that even if you're replacing somebody else, like David replaced Saul, mm -hmm. you're still God's plan A. Mm. Okay? Have you received the grace of God? Mm. Yes, thank you. Are you willing to meet God on His terms, mm. come into agreement with His Word, and submit your life to His truth? Mm. If you are, you're chosen. Yes. The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. God is inviting you to join with him. He's not trying to do it to you. He wants to do it through you. Amen. You see, in his own sovereign wisdom, God chooses to partner with human beings to accomplish his kingdom purposes on earth. I'm guessing you most likely know the invitation that God's extended to you. It might be for salvation. Maybe you don't know Jesus yet, and tonight is the night. He's extending that salvation Amen. opportunity. I encourage you to say yes to Jesus. Yes. His, his, his grace is coming to you. Connect with your faith. You, know, you can talk to other people who have already done that. And we'll tell you, it's a good deal. <coughs> it's a very good deal. Um, but maybe you're already a believer. Maybe God's calling you to something else. You don't, even, you don't even want to share with other people, but you know in your heart what it is. I encourage you, say yes. yes. Because, yes. you know, Odds are he's not asking you to sell everything you have and move across the ocean to start a work. But he might be. But the thing is, you probably already know what that invitation is, whatever it is. I encourage you, respond to that invitation of faith. Take action. Don't receive God's grace in vain. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, it's okay if what you do is small at first. Yes. When we thought that God was calling us to move across to Scotland and start a Bible college, the first thing we did was send an email. Mm -hmm. I was kind of terrified to send that email because I didn't know how the response would be back. But that was the first tiny faith step in a long chain of faith steps that led us to Scotland to start a Bible college campus, raise up a team, hand it off to the team, and now go back to the States and do even more things. Every single time God has spoken to Lisa and I, we've made it a habit to say yes. And we've not been disappointed yet. I encourage you not to take God's grace in vain. Take, and don't be, don't be bothered if it's a small step at first, because that small step leads to another step, to another step, to another step. And before long, you look back and you're like, oh my God, look how far we came. Yeah. You know, that's how it works. So I have no idea where your step of faith will ultimately lead you, but I do promise you something. I promise you that you will walk with God. It's going to be an amazing journey that you wouldn't want to change for anything in the world. At dinner tonight, I was talking with Pastor Diane and, and the folks about some of my background. See, I, I flew off of aircraft carriers while I was a navigator. Okay, we're contact lenses. Right? The way I explain, anybody see the original Top Gun movie or the new Top Gun movie? No. Okay. Well, we got one or two. I, I was like, I was the backseater. I was goose, but I lived. Okay. Um, but I've done some amazingly cool things. Is what I'm getting at. You know, I just had a very blessed life, and that was even before I was a believer. Nothing compares to saying yes to God and walking with Him. And, and experiencing his kingdom here now in this life. So I encourage you, don't let yourself stay saved and stuck if that's where you feel you are. Say yes to God. Mm -hmm. You know, don't receive his grace in vain. Add your faith. Step out. Come into agreement with the kingdom. And watch him do amazing things in your life too. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, I'd like to pray for you. Lord, thank you so much for these good folks who been here this evening and, and listen to your word. I pray that you make it effective in their lives. I pray that you give them the courage to stand up and say yes to you and experience your goodness in a new way. And, and I, I pray that you do things in their life that are way beyond all they can ask or imagine. And it, it's so amazing they can't help but share it with others and tell everyone around them how good you are in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Amen.